is a little bit different. And I, I chose this case more for its broad applicability because the themes and the questions presented here were really consistent threads in many of the patients I've cared for that experienced substance use disorders. And, and I, I felt as if the, the topics that Dr. Cass was gonna shed light on were just really, really important um, for us to talk about just because of how common they are. Um, so I'm gonna try and share my slides and make sure that everyone can see them. Okay. I'm gonna see. Hold on, it's giving me sharing options. Give me a second. Okay. Choose A. Yeah. Let me see what's happening here. Hold on. Give me just a second. Okay, I think I got it now. How does that look? All right, finally. Okay, um, so just briefly, uh, I'm gonna present a case that highlights the complexity of an ADHD diagnosis um, and management among individuals with substance use disorders, and then utilize this case as a framework for a larger discussion of how to best approach comorbidities, specifically ADHD, during concurrent treatment of addiction. So to start out, I want to tell you about A.H. So A.H. is a 36-year-old woman married uh, with four children, two of, of whom she gave birth to, um, and she works as a freelance photographer. Some brief background on her. So she has a childhood diagnosis of anxiety, but has very little kind of memory of this period of her life and, and didn't remark on it um, significantly during our time together. It really wasn't until her early 20s when she started to struggle with a lot of somatic symptoms and was given a diagnosis of fibromyalgia as well as began presenting to the emergency department pretty frequently for complaints of neck pain for which she was given oral hydrocodone. And this is really when she started to present more to care. And soon after uh, presenting to the emergency department and receiving hydrocodone several times, she began obtaining it illicitly um, to the point that she was using about 200 milligrams of hydrocodone daily uh, and was ultimately diagnosed with an opioid use disorder outside of our system of care and did not enter our system until 2015 when she became pregnant and her outpatient provider did not feel comfortable managing her opioid use disorder and pregnancy. And so she joined our VMART program and was cared for by Dr. Young, one of our colleagues, who then transitioned her uh, to our outpatient addictions clinic in 2016. So she has now been um, cared for by the resident clinic for a little over four years. And over this course of four years, she has had more than 50 appointments with providers in our system. So I'm going to spare everyone a longitudinal case because we would be here for a really long time and instead focus on some of the themes and symptoms that came up consistently over this course of four years. So as I'm sure you guys are all reading on the screen, um, she had a lot of symptoms. And while each of these symptoms was not necessarily present at every single visit, they were all present very consistently um, off and on throughout the course of this four years, regardless of the treatment that we were providing. And you'll see here that I've highlighted many of them in blue. Um, and these symptoms highlighted in blue are those that could definitely be explained by a major depressive episode um, and or generalized anxiety disorder. And this was a diagnosis that she um, had been given prior to meet, meeting her and that she met criteria for consistently during the time um, that I was caring for her off and on. 
the same list of symptoms now looked at through the lens of potentially poorly controlled addiction. Um, we can see here that some of those symptoms I highlighted overlap quite a bit, um, but that was another thing that really came up consistently in her care was this question of, are we appropriately managing her addiction? Is she stable from an addiction standpoint? And then finally, I highlight those which made me worry about ADHD. Now she did not have a childhood diagnosis of ADHD, but we also had pretty limited information about her childhood. We knew that she had graduated high school but had not had any higher education and has struggled consistently in her career to be able to maintain jobs. Um, and just consistently throughout this four years really talked a lot about her difficulty focusing, her forgetfulness and the ways in which this had really impacted her life. Um, sorry, I'm clear. I'm having some, some uh, technology difficulties over here. So now I want to talk a little bit about her behaviors because we all know that symptoms are self-reported and behaviors are oftentimes equally or more important for us to take a look at. So here are many of the behaviors that she either reported or that were observed over the past four years. And some of these could be explained by a major depressive episode or by anxiety as well. Um, you know, notably laying in bed all day can certainly be a sign of, of depression. Um, when I say non-adherence and self-adjustment of medications, I can elaborate on that to say that she, there were times when she was taking buprenorphine six or seven times a day. Um, and it was to relieve these negative affective states that she was experiencing. And so that was definitely concerning for a poorly controlled anxiety and depression. Um, but these symptoms were also really concerning for poorly controlled addiction. Uh, and, and oftentimes when we see people utilizing buprenorphine several times through day, th through, throughout the day, we worry that, we're, that they're using this medication more like a drug rather than as a treatment. In addition, she had some unique uh, behaviors, including really heavy use of goodie powder. She would use it um, several times per day to the maximum um, allotted on the bottle. Um, and then the same thing with Sudafed, um, such that all of her UDSs were positive um, for amphetamines. And then with the exception of one aberrant UDS for methamphetamines would, um, would come back with confirmations consistent with Sudafedrin. And, um, and yet some of these behaviors really could be explained by ADHD as well. She was missing appointments, she was running out of medications, but it was oftentimes because she was struggling to stay organized, because she would lose track of whether she had taken her medication for that day. Uh, and in addition, you know, there's some possibility that this heavy use of caffeine or stimulant over-the-counter medications and even the single use of meth could have potentially been self-medication. Now, on top of this, she had a lot of social stressors going on. She was under significant financial strain consistently over the four years. She was in a situation of pretty significant intimate partner violence, specifically with a lot of uh, shame and guilt related to her addiction, such that her husband really uh, made her feel guilty about her need to come to treatment and kept her on an incredibly tight leash in terms of any access to their sh shared finances to the, to the degree that once every three weeks when she would come to our appointments, she had saved up enough to purchase a Coca-Cola. Um, and this was like a really big deal for her to have this small amount of freedom and independence. Um, and then finally, she was taking care of four children during this time. And this could certainly interfere with her ability to make it to appointments um, and to, to really navigate some of the challenges of our healthcare system. So all in all, looking at this, it is incredibly clear that di diagnosis was, that, that a diagnosis was really confusing. She had signs of depression, she had signs of poorly controlled addiction, she had signs of ADHD, and then all of these social factors that we were also trying to manage at the same time. And so I was understandably a little bit overwhelmed about how best to care for her. And 
what to do first. Um, so I'm going to talk finally just about the treatment plan that I did before I um, hand this over to Dr. Cast. And I'm presenting this in a stepwise fashion, but in reality, I was really kind of focusing on all of these things concurrently. Um, and, and the first question that I asked myself is, have we optimized her addiction treatment? As we saw before, many of her symptoms could have been consistent with poorly controlled addiction. And so for AH, that started with making sure she was on the appropriate dose of buprenorphine. She had attempted to self-wean from 24 milligrams down to 20 milligrams many times. And she did consistently do much better when she was on that higher dose of buprenorphine. Now, knowing that that is a higher than average necessary dose of buprenorphine, one of the other big questions that came up was, was she administering it properly? She was a smoker. Um, she also consumed caffeinated beverages regularly. And so focusing and making sure that she was rinsing her mouth out before each dose, that she was not taking more than two, tab um, more than two sublingual tablets um, or films simultaneously. These were really important things to make sure that we weren't missing anything from an addiction side. And then finally, you know, she had been breastfeeding very early on in the course of her treatment. Was she taking the buprenorphine an appropriate number of times per day? Did it need to be dosed more than once per day? Um, and last but certainly not least, you know, was she getting appropriate group therapy and support? Um, and she was actively involved in our, our monthly groups, but had not been able to really extend her, her group support treatment beyond that into any additional 12-step or other um, addiction treatment options beyond medication management. So in addition to trying to optimize her addiction treatment, I was trying to make sure we were appropriately treating her depression and anxiety. And this is something that was a big part of many of the treatment plans, both of me and those before and after me who have cared for her. Um, and over the course of, of these four years, she had two full uh, treatment courses of SSRIs, both fluoxetine and sertraline. Um, she had been trialed on duloxetine as well. Um, mirtazapine, which had been helpful intermittently, but still developed these recurrent symptoms um, and struggled, had been tried on, on Wellbutrin, and had also been tried on Atomoxetine due to this concern for possible concurrent ADHD. Now, there was certainly at times concerns for adherence um, or side effects with these medications, but overall she had pretty significant trials of treatment for depression and anxiety, and despite that continued to have quite significant residual symptoms and was never able to really get to a point of stability. Thirdly, um, I was asking myself, have we addressed social contributors? So financial concerns were huge. Um, and one big thing that we were able to do was get grant support through the MAP program so that she was not having to pay for her monthly buprenorphine um, scripts. Another thing that she and I talked about frequently was the situation of intimate partner violence. Um, and, and we did provide or attempt to provide domestic violence resources um, for her, though this is not something that she ultimately pursued in the time that I was caring for her. And so this leads me to my last question and the one that will sort of set the stage for our larger discussion today, which is when and how do we consider treatment of ADHD? And this patient and in the dozens of other patients I have that, that present similarly, you know, to say to what degree does substance use, depression, anxiety need to be stable before I start asking myself, maybe we need to treat the ADHD because until we get that under control, um, it's going to be really difficult to help her be stabilized. And so this will conclude my portion of the talk. And um, before Dr. Cass takes it away, I am going to do my best to release a poll for everyone. Um, let me see if I can do this correctly. Okay, I am launching a poll and if, if someone could tell me if it's popped up, awesome. Um, there should be five questions um, and then once we've got a pretty good consensus of answers, I will pass it along to Dr. Cast. It's saying that the host people can't vote, which is really sad. 
<laughs> You've been excluded from the voting, apparently. We've got about 40% of the votes in and they are rolling fast. Uh, Dr. Scott, remind me when when uh, we end this. Is it going to disappear, or are we going to be able to look at uh, and talk about these? We, I should be able to release it so that everyone can see the results. Great, awesome. I think we're at sixty-six percent. That may be the close to as good as we might be able to do. So let's. Sounds good to me. I can go ahead and end the poll. Bigger. And I have shared the results. Can everyone see? I can it says see. Says attendees are now viewing poll results. I will let awesome. you take it away. Great, thank you, Dr. Scott. Excellent presentation, um, and set me up for my uh, talk very well. So I think um, these questions are mostly to get you thinking about these patients similar to, and some of the questions that come up in the, in the case that Dr. Scott presented. So it's, it's good to see that we're kind of all across the board with uh, question one. And, you know, I think that this is a question that a lot of people will disagree uh, about and have different, uh, different thoughts about. And I think hopefully after I present the data to you guys, um, uh, it, we have some time to discuss kind of the pros and cons here because I think there's um, there's not really one answer for every person. And uh, with question two, uh, there is an answer, and the, uh, most of you got it right. It is all of the above uh, for for that um, uh, among those who um, have an ADHD diagnosis and have substance use disorder. Each one of these is. Uh, is uh, unfortunately the case for them, and uh, we'll, we'll go into that in more detail for number three. Also did very, uh, did, actually I think that the, uh, the, the reds are not the answers, so just so you guys know, I think that's just pointing out which one has the most votes. Uh, but number three, there's something we're gonna learn here in the, in the lecture, so stay tuned. Number four, uh, the most recent stimulant trials. Um, this, uh, will also be something that I think we're going to we're going to look at but most of you did very well there and finally um, we're neck and neck 50 50 on number five so I'm, I'm very excited to share uh, to have some things for us to talk about so all right let's uh, jump right in and um, let's see viewing that okay everybody seeing it awesome so as I said, I think Dr. Scott really set up this talk uh, uh, well. And um, for my portion, we're gonna focus 
really on um, describing the relevant epidemiology and consequences of comorbid ADHD in substance use disorder treatment, discuss the complicated effects of ADHD pharmacotherapy on substance use disorder outcomes, and apply that evidence um, for ADHD pharmacotherapy to our clinical practice um, and making sure everybody understands what uh, we can do to, to mitigate the risk that goes along with prescribing some of the medications that are the most efficacious. So first, starting with the epidemiology, um, AD, uh, as is the case with, with substance use disorders in general, comorbidity is the rule, not the exception. Um, and in our, in our substance use disorder treatment settings in particular, you know, we, we, the, the rates of ADHD in patients presenting to our clinics is higher than in a pediatrician's office. So um, this is um, the numbers that came out of an N of over 6,000, 29 studies included in this. And it, it really seems that between somewhere between one fifth to one quarter of patients in our clinics are going to have a comorbid ADHD diagnosis if you're doing uh, a rigorous uh, SCID-like uh, diagnostic interview. So we really should be seeing a lot of this. And part of um, the, the, the reason that we often are not diagnosing it is that the, the symptoms can easily be attributed to other things. But this striking fact is important to keep in mind as we're seeing our patients in this setting and thinking about their care. Um, why might that be the case? Why is it so comor comorbid? Uh, one thing that we've known for a long time is this meta-analysis uh, from about 10 years ago uh, shows is that having childhood ADHD increases your risk uh, in prospective studies to develop a substance use disorder. Um, the odds ratio is somewhere between 1.12 and 2.25, pretty wide range, and, and, and there are even uh, higher numbers in some cohorts. So uh, we knew childhood ADHD was a risk, risk factor. This was one of the things that had prompted kind of a big push in child and adolescent psychiatry to be treating ADHD to see if that moved the dial on who develops it and who doesn't. Now, um, since then, the we've really developed a pretty clear understanding that there's a lot of overlap between the genetics, the neurocircuitry, and the environmental risk factors that, that, that play into both substance use disorder development as well as ADHD. Um, both of them on the genetic side seem to involve a real um, hits to the dopamine and other monoamine systems that lead to a, a relative hypodopaminergic state, uh, which is something that in, in the realm of addiction Treatment in neurobiology we know is, is also associated there. So there's con considerable overlap additionally in the neurocircuitry, both in our cognitive inhibitory control circuits, as well as in uh, relevant dopamine transmission. And finally, some of the um, environmental risk factors that we know, particularly prenatally for, for and, and uh, early on in, in childhood, things that can increase your risk for ADHD are also associated with substance use disorder. So this, this kind of points out that neurodevelopmentally, both of these disorders are kind of pushing the patient in a similar direction. And uh, just to underscore on the neurobiology, uh, this is a, a review paper that was trying to bring together some of the theories of, you know, you can have relative, uh, more or less relative deficit in either the inhibitory control from the cognitive control networks versus the um, uh, impairments in reward processing and the hypodopaminergic state, which can lead to more sensation seeking. Essentially, if your, your dopamine tone is down in your brain, um, it, it can lead to a state of kind of uh, looking for things that increase that for you. And so, all of that is to say that these two disorders look very similarly when we try to put them under the lens of, of uh, neurobiology and their underlying um, processes. Now, finally, to, just to speak to the familial risk with these, um, looking prospectively in a large cohort of patients, 520 followed uh, up in Boston, um, looking at a child with ADHD, following them forward over um, uh, 10 plus years and looking at their, their first degree relatives, parent and, parents and siblings, which of, the, which of um, these groups, kids with ADHD, uh, kids who have ADHD and also develop a substance use disorder, 
kids who only have a substance use disorder and a comparison group, what's the risk of their first degree relative having a substance use disorder down the line? And it's pretty clear that having a substance use disorder yourself increases the risk for your family members. Having ADHD increases the risk equivalently um, for, for relatives having substance use disorders. And having both together um, seems to co-segregate. So that, that argues that the, the genes involved in ADHD and substance use disorder risk are, are close enough together that they tend to be inherited together in a certain way that, that leads to this, this pattern of um, heightened risk when they're both occurring together. So all of this pointing towards, there's, there's a lot of different ways to end up with a substance use disorder and the underlying neurobiology uh, is very, very much linked to ADHD. And as if that weren't enough, um, ADHD is linked to a number of our other disorders. So on the left, we have a community sample of patients and who, have, who are adults with um, uh, verified ADHD diagnoses and what are their rates of comorbid mood or anxiety disorders, which ranges from 38 to 47 percent among those folks. And then, uh, so that's a cross-sectional sample and a prospective sample on the right the rates of psychiatric comorbidity in, in individuals with ADHD followed over 16 years shows a similar pattern. That within the mood disorders, the blue lines are much taller than the red lines, blue being ADHD, red being controls. And uh, clearly there is high risk for not just having ADHD, but also dealing with a major depression and anxiety um, or other uh, comorbid disorders. So again, Comorbidity is the rule, not necessarily the exception here. And that, you know, leads us with uh, a case presentation like Dr. Scott gave us, where there's a lot of things going on. We could attribute the symptoms to a number of, uh, of different disorders. And often our kind of favorite rule of, um, you know, keep it simple, diagnose the thing that unifies everything is not always uh, the, right, the right way to approach these patients. Sometimes it is, um, but not, uh, not if we're thinking about the epidemiology. And now before we leave this, just to make um, uh, a final statement, you know, it's not as if ADHD by itself is simple and we don't need to worry about it and there's no, there's no uh, consequential sequelae of it. By itself, uh, the syndrome, you know, it, it affects our executive function. It increases impulsivity and hyperactivity, which leads to a lot of uh, functional problems. It is extraordinarily prevalent uh, in, in our uh, child and adolescent uh, patients, somewhere from 8 to 18 percent, and 60 percent of individuals go on to have persistent symptoms as adults. It may not be fully syndromal, but they do still tend to uh, have difficulty, and we know that outcomes for individuals just with ADHD have worsened performance in education, work, relationships, criminal activity, and carceral system involvement, as well as accidental death. So there, there are a lot of outcomes that just having ADHD by itself increases the risk for. And just to drive that point home, ADHD by itself um, in a prospective cohort leads to significant differences between controls and socioeconomic outcomes, including reliance on parental support as an adult, graduating college, um, uh, high achieving in educational and occupational work, and your overall socioeconomic status. So with that set up, um, thinking about, you know, what are the outcomes that are associated whenever ADHD and substance use disorder occur together? What are the things that we're worried about? So this, this tells us that this is a study showing the effects on, from baseline, ADHD symptom severity scales uh, across all of the symptoms listed below whenever the patient also has heavy alcohol use compared to individuals with ADHD who do not have heavy alcohol use. And as you can see here, um, most of these bars have one to three stars above them, indicating increasing um, uh, degrees of um, uh, significance as a finding. And all uh, this highlights 
essentially that whenever you have ADHD, your symptoms are worsened whenever the substance use disorder is active. And I've highlighted with the, the red arrow, you know, one of them uh, here, but uh, a lot of these symptoms can affect it is problems with appointments. So having active use can in impact your ability to, to engage in the treatment that's going to address that. Now, on the converse side, how are substance use disorder outcomes affected by having ADHD? Um, we've had a number of studies look at this. This is the, uh, the one that kind of uh, brought a number of them together, uh, showing that patients with ADHD have earlier onset and longer duration of the substance use disorder syndrome. They typically present with heavier and more frequent use patterns, and they tend to require longer treatment duration and are less likely during that duration to get to full remission in their treatment. So they tend to be the patients who are not doing as well in our, in our, in our, in our clinics. And in addition, they're also less likely to stick with treatment, as we talked about with the effects of these uh, cognitive symptoms on their ability to adhere. So this is uh, a study looking at the weeks retained in treatment uh, in ADHD patients versus non-ADHD patients, as well as those who made it past 60 days. And 60 to 90 days in treatment is actually a really important marker in retention because we know that patients that don't make it past that, their long-term outcomes as far as uh, recovery as well as functional outcomes are equivalent to patients who leave treatment immediately after uh, detox. So it's actually important that we do retain patients long-term and, and that was a significant finding uh, as well. Now, one additional word on retention because we've been hinting at it a little bit. The, the studies that have looked at risk factors related to poor retention in substance use disorder treatment, both in uh, patients with addiction broadly, as well as patients who have ADHD and addiction together, um, the, the common factor is cognitive deficits in that having worse cognitive functioning leads to reduced retention in general for substance use disorder treatment, but also particularly for patients who have ADHD. And so not only are their outcomes worse, it's harder for them to stick in treatment and to really get through a good course. So all of this leads to the question, what if we treat the ADHD? Um, can we expect that this is going to, to help them? I think the received wisdom is patients don't respond when they have substance use disorder. The active substance use disorder is likely to, to prevent them from being able to benefit from the medications we know are so effective. Uh, because, in fact, the medications for ADHD, which I have listed here, the FDA-approved group and the non-FDA-approved group, among medications we have in, the, in mental health and psychiatry and substance use disorder treatment, these are probably have some of the largest effect sizes when we think about just treating ADHD by itself. Um, so there should be a lot of optimism that, hey, we can really move the dial here and, and help these patients improve their symptoms and be able to engage in treatment and, and overcome some of the difficulties that they're dealing with. But often the, the anticipation is that patients with active use, they're not going to respond as well. So now of note here before I move on, it, um, consistently in the, in the adult studies, uh, but also in uh, children as well, stimulants do outperform non-stimulants typically in, in these trials and the non-FDA approved medications um, are, are similar in, in that non-stimulant category. So, with that, what's the evidence for treating ADHD in patients who are presenting for substance use disorder treatment specifically? And actually, we, we have a lot of data on this. There have been 15 randomized controlled trials since 2002 of over 1,300 patients. Um, the tough thing about this data is it's a heterogeneous group. There, you really can't do a meta-analysis because the outcomes are different across them and the medications that they use are different. The populations they're studying may be specific to one substance use disorder. All of that said, that doesn't mean there aren't useful findings that come out of it. One additional uh, problem in interpreting the data is earlier on, the earlier studies tended to use much lower doses, use formulations that didn't have great bioavailability, and often used a combination of lower potency, non-stimulant medications. 
all of that together led to the initial studies pointing us in the direction that, oh, it doesn't seem like these medications work as well in this population. When in fact, the way that we were designing the studies and, and the medications we were using and how we were using them probably wasn't adequate. Um, now, the, the important thing though was even with those under, under treated uh, studies, most still did show a signal that there was some ADHD symptom response. Now, the ones that I wanna highlight and go into specifically are the ones that I want you to walk away from this talk uh, knowing about because I think this, this is where the evidence stands today as far as the, the most recent studies using higher dose and, and higher quality study designs. And the first one I wanna talk about is a study uh, that came out uh, about 12 years ago at this point, but this is, the, this is the study that tells us what does atomoxetine, the, the one non-stimulant that we often try before we go down the stimulant route, what's the evidence for it in this population? And the answer is it's really in alcohol use disorder. So in these patients, as shown here, um, there, and this is a, a showing you the change in a ADHD um, symptom score that for these patients with comorbid alcohol use disorder, atomoxetine dosed at, a, at a, an average dose of 80 to 90 milligrams a day did improve um, symptoms in the ADHD spectrum and combined that with the findings on outcomes for the alcohol use, it did reduce the cumulative heavy drinking episodes. Now, it did not reduce abstinence, uh, a time, to, time to relapse, but it did have an effect on cumulative heavy drinking episodes, which is a meaningful outcome in this population. And so this is the study that really tells us what, what role might atomoxetine have the other studies that have been done with the non-stimulants have been less robust, have shown less robust findings, uh, and that's important to think about as you're, you're problem solving, what medications do I wanna try for my patient? But this is an important one to know about. Now, stepping over into the, the class of medications that we know are the most effective, stimulant therapy, that also come along with the risks that we often worry about. First, answering the question, is there evidence that these work in, in this population? And the answer at this point is, is yes. And it's a pretty strong yes. This is a study from 2011 looking at um, using Oros methylphenidate, which is the um, osmotically uh, controlled release formulation of methylphenidate, a, a long-acting abuse deterrent formulation that shows uh, clear evidence that there's improvement uh, at 16 weeks in ADHD symptoms using this medication at typical doses. This is before high dose trials were started. Um, this is using typical uh, 40 uh, or so milligram doses. And the, the outcomes on the side of the toxicology, meaning whether or not this oral methylphenidate actually improved uh, substance use outcomes were similarly positive, uh, particularly if your ADHD symptoms responded you had more negative urine toxicology screens. And this is a raw number, six out of 12 total toxicology screens. So about half versus only a quarter of your toxicology screens being negative um, in, in that study. Now, an additional study in 2013, looking particularly at nicotine use disorder because the prior study was uh, actually in um, all comers with, substance use, with any substance use decide, uh, diagnosis. Um, in nicotine use disorder, there was a finding that with increasing quartile of ADHD symptom severity, with quartile four, the one furthest right being uh, the highest symptom severity, you had improved um, abstinence from nicotine as your symptom severity went up when you were placed on oros methylphenidate at typical doses. So this also goes along with a, a dose response um, idea that the more severe your dopamine deficit, the more severe your, your underlying pathology, the more likely you are to respond to robust therapy. Now, stepping forward into 2014, this study that um, was, is, is actually has the longest, uh, longest follow-up uh, out to 24 weeks, uh, a half a year, in this population that was actually a, a population being released from the carceral system, starting on stimulant therapy with an underlying diagnosis of an amphetamine use disorder. We're on very high dose methylphenidate, up to 180 milligrams a day, 
clearly showed on the left improvement versus placebo in their um, ADHD scores out to 24 weeks that was maintained, as well as reduction um, or improved number of negative urine toxicology for the substance uh, that you're worried about, which is the, the amphetamine uh, use disorder. Now, in addition, in that study, they also had a signal for retention, showing that at the top line, uh, going from 100% retained out to 168 uh, days or half a year versus placebo, clearly there was higher retention. Now of note, it's overall low retention in general, it's below 50% at half a year, um, which is low even in the addiction treatment world. But uh, again, this is a population uh, being in the carceral system that does tend to struggle with follow-up. And um, so uh, in this higher dose group, we're seeing additional positive outcomes in substance use disorder treatment, um, even including retention. Now, Coupled with that is a study that we did um, naturalistically looking at the outpatient uh, addiction clinic uh, in, um, at MGH and, and following patients who were on stimulant therapy versus who were not on stimulant therapy with ADHD in that clinic setting and looking at their overall survival and treatment out to two years. So further than the randomized control studies have looked at. And it was a, a very robust response um, looking at patients who were getting ADHD medication from the start versus those who never got ADHD medication. There was a very steep decline in initial retention. Uh, we lost uh, the, the risk of dropout within that critical 90-day period was uh, five-fold uh, that of those on stimulant therapy. And um, that was maintained separation out to two years, which was a pretty remarkable finding. And when we did the uh, regression analysis, looking at a number of other covariates that could be predicting this, including suboxone therapy. ADHD medication was uh, the only factor that was uh, significantly associated with retention. Now, the last study before we jump into kind of what do we do about all of this and, and have a discussion. Um, this is the most recent one in 2015, looking at high-dose mixed amphetamine salts and the response both in, uh, both of these are looking at response to uh, an ADHD symptoms uh, improvement versus placebo, uh, showing that 60 and 80 milligrams are about equivalent, they're not different from each other here, um, but particularly on the uh, outcome of cocaine use, because this was a, a group of cocaine use disorder patients, higher dose did seem to make a difference for the substance use disorder outcome in general. Now. Um, in that cohort, they also did a secondary analysis looking at, well, what happened to the marijuana users in that group? Um, did it have any secondary effect for them? Turns out, out to 14 weeks, being on that uh, mixed amphetamine salt uh, medication also reduced other substance use disorders as well, which is an interesting finding. Now, seeing all of this, one might think, you know, are, are we actually seeing a treatment effect similar to agonist therapy and opioid treatment? Like, is this because we're giving them a dopamine agonist and that, that's what's really solving this problem here? Now, there is uh, just this year um, a meta-analysis looking at over 2,000 patients through 38 trials of using agonist treatment. And here they called, they called agonist treatment amphetamines, methylphenidate, or modafinil. Um, it, does that help? cocaine or amphetamine use disorder, period. Um, so not whether they have ADHD, just if you have a cocaine or amphetamine use disorder, do you respond to agonist treatment? And historically, we thought no, but when we bring the, the studies together and look a little bit more closely in, uh, at, at what treatments might actually be helpful, the main outcome of this meta-analysis was that the the more potent agonists, the amphetamines, which is the top group up here with the diamond furthest to the right, clearly showed a difference that, that favors um, improved sustained abstinence with amphetamine uh, treatment, less so for modafinil and methylphenidate. And in addition, the dose had, had, had a really important effect. So it was really the high dose uh, treatments that seemed to, to to be driving driving that finding versus the low dose. So 
What does it mean yeah. when they say on that slide, what does it mean when it says psychostimulants events versus placebo events, just to unpack that? Yeah, so th this is essentially the way that they were trying to combine the studies um, because the outcomes were diverse. They were looking at essentially sustained abstinence and an event is, is talking about the number of uh, times that they are uh, finding either a positive toxicology or essentially the patient is popping as, as, as having use. So in the sustained abstinence uh, context, the events that they're counting are episodes of, of use within, within that context. And so, Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. So that's, what's moving them one way or the other. Um, and we can talk about that a little bit more, but I want to make sure we get to the clinical application because I think that's the most important thing for the audience here. So what do we do about all of this information? Um, I think this slide is really important regardless of what we're doing. Um, we want to be risk mitigating and not risk averse uh, because there is actually no way for us to um, reduce all uh, possible risk to the patient because not treating an active syndrome is as risky to the patient as um, uh, the concerns around misuse, diversion, and everything else that can happen when we're prescribing controlled substances. So we really want to find a prescribing practice that does our best to mitigate risks on both sides and find a, a good place where we feel comfortable and the patient feels comfortable and they're getting the treatment that they need. And just a, a word toward misuse. Um, what we know about patients who are diverting or misusing their stimulants, most of them uh, who are using it are getting it free from friends or relatives or they're buying it or, st uh, or stealing it from them. And so the thing that that highlights is that they're not going to doctors and getting it directly from us. Um, additionally, most of the patients who have past year use are using it as prescribed and the group that is using it differently is higher than the group that actually would qualify for a stimulant use disorder. So there's gradations of what's going on whenever patients are doing something other than what we're asking them to do with the medicine. And one of the things that is most important in determining uh, misuse risk is how quickly that medication gets to the central nervous system and lights up our, our ventral tegmental area and the reward system. And this just illustrates the difference between injecting your methylphenidate versus taking it by mouth. And that uh, translates here to looking at the likability score uh, with the immediate release, the blue line being higher than the, um, uh, uh, the osmotically released uh, oral system, the green line, which is much lower on the likability scale, uh, much slower to get into the central nervous system and lasts much longer as well. So uh, that speaks to one of the things that will be a risk mitigating strategy. And finally, thinking about the safety of prescribing stimulants in this population, there is a 2016 Cochrane review looking at adult ADHD and stimulants uh, that found across 1,600 patients, there was no difference in dropout due to adverse events, there's no difference in dropout due to cardiovascular events, and no difference in serious adverse events across at least 400 patients in the studies that have been reported, which should help us feel more comfortable. Now, the important thing to note, that uh, review did not address risk of relapse, overdose, or other related substance use outcomes, which are important for us to think about in the particular population that we're treating with these stimulants. But all of the studies I've been showing you were looking directly at these substance use outcomes and showing that, in fact, treating the, this, treating the ADHD seems to improve those outcomes. So... Uh, this is the slide that I think is important to kind of leave here with in mind. What are the risk mitigating strategy, strategies that can address our concerns about misuse, about diversion, about toxicity, and about the stability of the substance use disorder? Um, and I think essentially most of these are in the context of what good addiction treatment looks like. Um, in the early or in the context of uh, substance use instability, um, seeing the patient at least weekly, getting regular toxicology screens and talking about the results and, and whether seeing whether or not the medication you're prescribing is there, seeing whether or not things that shouldn't be there are there, 
um, giving controlled supplies over a week uh, to two weeks and not more than that if you're able doing pill counts, but that's a, a rare event even, even in specialty settings. Ensuring that you're looking at the prescription drug monitoring program, using long acting formulations that are less likely to um, have that high likability score, have a shared decision, ma decision making process with the patient where you're educating them about the risks of being on this medicine, talking to them openly about the outcomes that you're looking for together, like how is this medicine gonna help and what are the things that would lead us to stop this trial because we're concerned that it's not helping and could actually be causing harm. And finally, involving support network, uh, which was complicated in the case that Dr. Scott presented because the support network was part of an intimate partner violence context, but getting uh, somebody uh, involved who can help make sure that all of these things are going well. So um, bottom line, early diagnosis and treatment of ADHD may have important effect, effects on treatment outcome. The timing of when you do that relative to how abstinent the patient is, is not well defined. Our typical conservative approach would favor greater relative abstinence, but we may be risking attrition, dropout, and, and adverse sequelae in this patient population. Um, additional psychiatric comorbidities are common. We really don't have a lot of evidence to say when we should be treating what, but generally ADHD pharmacotherapy is still effective even if there are active mood or anxiety disorders present. And adequate mood stabilization in the context of a bipolar spectrum disorder does typically mitigate the risk of a manic switch, which is something we often worry about in these patients. And finally, Atomoxetine, we really should be thinking about that in our alcohol use disorder patients. There's less evidence in other contexts. If we're using stimulants, we want uh, it to be in a safe risk mitigating context. We want to be using high dose, long acting stimulants that's, that show the benefit and really feeling like, you know, it's likely if, if the ADHD symptoms are pretty flagrant, it's likely that they're, more, that they're uh, going to respond to our treatment. Okay, so let's stop there. I wanted to acknowledge some of the people that I worked with, Dr. Rao Wylands at uh, MGH, Dr. Levin in uh, Columbia, and Dr. Yule at uh, BUMC. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Cast and Dr. Scott for a great presentation. Very stimulating, thought-provoking, and clear. Um, I have a couple questions in the chat box that I'm going to email to you just because we're low on time, but I wanted to ask one question, kind of practical tips. Anything that you found helpful, Dr. Cast, for um, teasing out the, the ADHD in the clinical setting in patients with substance use disorders? Because we know a lot of patients come to us and they tell us that they're concerned or that they've benefited from a stimulant. I don't know if there's any literature that tells us whether those are the ones we should be most worried about or actually whether it's people who are not telling us but who look like they're bouncing all over the room or, or somewhere in between. That's a great question. Actually, the the, there are a couple of, there's actually an international consensus statement on diagnosing ADHD in uh, this, uh, the substance use disorder uh, context. They actually point out that it's incumbent on us to have our antennae up for identifying symptoms that are likely related to a substance use disorder. Because often the patients themselves attribute it to, that's my addiction, that's something else causing that. They, they don't always have insight into it. Now, that doesn't mean that if the patient does have, you know, the, the uh, ability to recognize that, yeah, I was treated with this before and I seem to do well and somehow I got off of it. So I think because um, the bottom line is there's a, really ADHD is a clinical diagnosis. Um, we, we don't need to um, be sending every patient that we're worried about this to get neuropsychological testing to really confirm partially because there, there's not a perfect neuropsychological test to tell us definitively, yes, this, this, this finding is due to ADHD, especially whenever we have other uh, syndromes like substance use that could be causing uh, the inattention uh, it's, and, and some of the symptoms that they're presenting with. And it's, it's really a putting together their, their, their ability to tell you their developmental history their ability to tell you what symptoms they're dealing with, the observed behaviors, and continuing to re, uh, reassess the patient over a longitudinal relationship where you're really seeing, you know, this is my hypothesis. I think this might be going on. We have enough data to make a good trial here and see if there's a response or not. 
and to do it in a safe way. Thank you. That's helpful. Um, I have a few questions in the chat that I'm going to email to you and Dr. Scott after the session, just because we're at the end of the hour. But thank you again very much for a great presentation. Great. Thank you all for having us. Thanks, everyone. I think you can follow up with Jenny Laws Wolf with any questions about getting access to this presentation. And I think it may be on the website. Yeah, eventually. Thanks, everyone. Bye. All.